Hello and welcome today to a webinar hosted by Bruker Nanosurfaces. Um, this is a discussion uh, called Straight Talk about laser and laser scanning and coherent scanning 3D microscope capabilities. I appreciate you taking some time to join for the discussion today and I hope you'll find it beneficial and uh, interesting at the same time. So the outline here of the discussion, we'll, we'll go through some brief introductory information, uh, a little bit about Bruker, a little bit about uh, who I am, and then we'll go on into uh, a discussion about the different uh, optical microscope techniques and then specifically spend time on laser scanning microscopes and, and uh, coherent scanning microscopes. And then uh, you can see the, the bullets here about some of the different uh, materials we'll cover during this discussion. I would like to mention just uh, briefly sort of an in administrative detail. There's a questions dialogue. Um, you can type your question anytime throughout the discussion and I'll pick up all the questions at the end of the discussion to the best of my ability. Uh, anything I can't answer or I'm not able to get to if we run out of time, I will absolutely uh, respond via email to those questions so that we can make sure that we uh, try to clarify or, or answer or address any further remaining questions that you might have. Also, uh, we offer at the end of the webinar, this is a free webinar series that we do from Bruker, and uh, for our, so that we can make sure that we're delivering something of value to people that participate, uh, there's a survey at the end that I would like to, uh, to make the request that you please fill that out. I think it'll take you about 30 seconds is what I've, what I've asked people in the past and they said it's just a few questions to fill that out. So again, thank you for taking time today and I really appreciate it. And with that, we'll go ahead into the introductions. So really briefly, uh, introduce Bruker Nano Surfaces. Uh, we are a business uh, that's part of Bruker Corporation and we offer some uh, various surface metrology and um, testing equipment that you can see here. We have uh, specialized equipment for scanning probe or atomic force microscopy, as well as 3D optical microscopy, stylus profilometry, and then also tribology and mechanical testing. And there's a good synergy across these different techniques and testing uh, materials testing capabilities for a wide variety of industries or, or users. And uh, we enjoy the partnerships we have with our, our uh, friends in industry very much and trying to solve their problems and meet their needs. So, <clears throat> excuse me, briefly, uh, Bruker Stylus and Optical Metrology, which is the business where I work, uh, it's based in Tucson, Arizona. We're really um, interested in uh, keeping ahead in technology uh, for both optical and stylus capabilities. Uh, we have a uh, wide range of patents and in the technology areas of expertise needed to do surface metrology both contact and non-contact. Um, we also concentrate our energy on lean Six Sigma based processes for manufacturing um, and trying really hard to uh, address rapid needs of, of people uh, across a wide range of, of applications in a wide range of industries. And just a uh, note at the bottom Bruker Nano Surfaces is part of Bruker Materials, which is a division of Bruker Corporation. Uh, very briefly, uh, my name is Matt Novak. I've been the Applications Development Manager here with Bruker, uh, coming up on three years, not quite um, in early uh, next year. I'll be here three years. I've got about uh, 17 years experience uh, across a range of disciplines. I, I have a background in physics and then optical uh, optical science was my PhD. I spent time doing fabrication and optical metrology throughout that time in, in medical devices, uh, worked in uh, optical fabrication for large telescope optics and most recently these last three years been doing this role as applications development here with Bruker. So now that we've gone through the introductions, I'll give you a little bit of information about so why the, the title Straight Talk. And I think um, really trying to 
give some balanced information on 3D microscopes and specifically the ones that I mentioned in the title. There's, there are several and we'll get to that. But uh, you know, we realize as people that are supplying business to business that capital metrology equipment is really an investment in both your money, where you're out searching for and purchasing some type of metrology equipment, and your time, which is you know, time spent on the tools or learning the tool and also training which is meant ideally to increase your productivity. You, you know, if you're not getting a value from the metrology, uh, it doesn't solve a problem for you and it doesn't help you save energy or time or money, then it, it doesn't deliver what we would like it to deliver. And, and I think really um, the experience at least that I've had over the last several years has shown um, lots of industry partners have lost all three of some of these things due to some misunderstandings that they've had about different techniques that are available. And I think um, in this discussion I'll, I'll be balanced about what different techniques can do and, and where they're good and, and hopefully at the end of the discussion you'll have a better sense for what uh, can be delivered by different technologies that we're going to talk about. So who will benefit from the webinar and who, who do I intend in the audience? I mean, everybody is welcome, obviously. It's a free presentation, but uh, I'm specifically thinking of either technicians, engineers, or researchers where you're looking at choices about different metrology for uh, both 3D imaging, but also looking at height measurements with a microscope type system. Uh, people that have heard that it's difficult to use uh, 3D microscopes that are based on interference techniques or coherence scanning. Um, also, people that might have had poor experiences with or poor results from such systems in the past. And the technologies that are available today and, and taking advantage of faster computers and better cameras and different uh, software and fa faster computational capabilities in general have made a great difference to the capabilities that can be offered by such systems. And then also uh, laser scanning confocal users, um, which those tools are, are good for a very uh, wide range of things as well, but users who like the performance but might need faster images uh, on larger areas. And we'll go into the details there a little bit. After the presentation, I'm hopeful that you'll be aware of these different, some of the different 3D microscope techniques. Um, and looking at metrology at all these different spatial scales or, or vertical scales as well, nanometer, micron, and millimeter scales. I'd like uh, people to understand why 3D microscopes based on light coherence or coherent scanning systems and interference are among the world's fastest and most capable. Uh, and I want you to be able to decide with confidence whether this type of a system or another one is really what you need. Um, and I think that'll help and it, it's a value uh, that I, I really would like everyone to take away from the discussion so that people can understand what value is delivered for accurate gauge capable imaging metrology and particularly for systems based on this type of coherent scanning. So I've given um, an overview and now the next section of the discussion is just a brief overview of the two, the two techniques that I described in the title uh, of, the, of the webinar. We'll go ahead and, and go into that now. So just a simple overview slide. There are many different um, ways that people make three-dimensional uh, images using a microscope and you might be familiar with or have heard of any or all of these different techniques there I've heard of digital scanning uh, micro microscopes I've called heard that called other things axial chromatism or axial chromatic confocal um, techniques are also valid and very useful techniques for specific applications uh, laser scanning confocal microscopes which is one of the key topics will or technologies will focus on spinning disk or NIPCO disk uh, systems, coherent scanning interference microscopes or white light interference microscopes, focus variation. The, these are a lot of different techniques that you may or may not have heard of. There are a lot of different choices for building up a height image out of microscope data. And 
Today, we're going to really focus on the, the yellow one and the green one. Um, the green and purple can be thought of as a similar thing. The yellow is similar to some of those other ones there. Uh, we'll really focus on those two and, and kind of hone in a little bit on the differences and, and how the technologies work so that hopefully people will have a, a better understanding of them while they're making choices about uh, their metrology needs. So as I said, we spend a little bit of time focusing on the, some two of the key uh, technologies. On the left-hand side, I just I made a simple diagram in the top uh, that shows the, the elements of a laser scanning confocal system. Uh, you can basically see there's three bullet points there that are kind of important. I think uh, there are two, the first one is two sensors are used in this type of a system where you have a, a CCD imaging system. It's the top left green uh, imaging system, which could be a, a different camera array and then also a white light source for that. And then typically there's a raster scanning laser uh, that's scanned using fast steering mirrors that you can see up on the upper right. There's a little laser. We'll go into details on this a little bit. They scan, um, scan that beam using these uh, fast steering mirrors to build the, the height data. And on the right, you can see a similar uh, breakdown, a, a simple structure on the upper right uh, for a white light interference-based system where you have um, a specialized objective that uh, can be moved vertically continuously in Z while you're capturing frames. The, the CCD image here is the same sensor that builds the height map. So that's one difference between these two techniques. Um, rather than scanning, um, raster scanning, you actually obtain the full image section uh, as you're moving at the camera frame rate. And then the height data is computed from this interference or coherence information that I've been talking about. So this is a, a little bit closer view of the uh, laser scanning system. And I guess just um, some elements that I think are, are important for people to, to recognize. Um, Image-wise, there's a, a separate channel on the left half that makes use of a, a white light source and the same imaging optic or the same microscope objective you can see down towards the sample. The blue, the blue arrows represent the light that goes to that imaging camera, which is totally different from the light that is sent to the uh, PMT or the sensor on the other side of the screen, the right-hand side. Um, that green uh, line, the green arrows represent the laser line. That could be a, a, a 400 nanometer uh, diode or four, 405, something like this. And it scans uh, using the my black box or light blue box XY scanning assembly uh, on the surface in, in each plane that you're interested in getting the height data. And then there's a confocal pinhole uh, that rejects the out-of-focus light on that other side uh, to give you the, the laser scanning confocal microscope behavior. So here, one really key thing to keep in mind is that the light intensity is what is used to build up the height map. And that'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that later, why that matters or what, what that really means in terms of functionality. So now I'll spend a little bit of time giving a similar explanation. This is the right upper right-hand picture for a, a coherence scanning, one version of a coherence scanning, a white light interference-based uh, 3D microscope. You can see here there are some uh, dual LED sources, high brightness LEDs. Um, there's a green and also a, a broadband uh, white source. and um, and then there are some optics that uh, take that light and actually uh, get it collimated. Uh, the schematic here isn't perfectly right, but the, you know, ultimately you have uh, collimated light that is going to be sent down through your specialized uh, objective. You can see it called a Moreau interferometer there on the bottom. Uh, and that objective is scanned vertically in a continuous way in order to build up the, the height map. Uh, the light reflected from the sample and the light reflected from that small black uh, rectangle within the Moreau interferometer uh, is the reference mirror. Those beams are interfered and imaged onto the detector array at the top of the screen. 
And the key thing to remember here is that the coherent light interference that you see on that detector array is what builds up the height map. And that, again, I'll explain a little bit more about what that means and why that's important for the operation of this type of a system in a, in a little while. So in the next section, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the different misunderstandings that people might have about 3D microscopes that are based on coherence or coherent scanning. So this is one of the key things that I think it's important to realize. I've seen uh, in many cases heard a lot of different statements made about um, white light interference or interference-based microscopes. And this applies to all the different versions of that, not just the ones that we make here, here at Bruker, but other people in the world make these types of systems as well. And, and you will hear these arguments or discussions about those kinds of systems made uh, I've heard them pretty generally that they're maybe hard to use or they also can't measure steep slopes or can't measure roughness. Um, you can't have color images or aren't able to measure low reflectant surfaces or um, you may have poor signal because out of focus light intrudes on the, on the imaging. And I think in reality people will find that these types of tools are, are pretty easy to set up and can be demonstrated to measure slopes and roughness. Um, have color imaging and, and look at low reflectance surfaces as well as deliver really excellent signal and noise. It's interesting to me in reality um, having an optics background and thinking about the systems in general <clears throat> a white light interference based system can also be thought of as a confocal technology. The, the only difference is instead of using a pinhole to keep the confocality you're using the light coherence to keep planes of uh, equal focus or um, co confocality being compared. And it's a one way to consider that they're really not that different if you think in a broad sense what, what is being used to make the height maps. It's just a different way of dictating what surfaces are in uh, comparison at the time and are confocal. <clears throat> So some of the key concepts, the, the next few slides, I think it's two or three, um, there are some key technical concepts I think that go along with understanding better some of the common misconceptions or, or misunderstandings about uh, coherent scanning systems and how different, uh, the different technologies that we've been talking about so far uh, perform their function of making height maps. So the the concepts are meant to illustrate how these two systems under discussion address a 3D aerial measurement. That's one of the concepts. And then focusing on these will, will help people decide what is the right choice for their, for their application or their need. Um, depending on the data quality you require, depending on the size of the image area and um, what is required for your exact application, um, one or the other of the technologies may meet your need very well. And uh, I think the, the information in these concepts I'm going to discuss will help you to decide which one could be best uh, suited for the application that you have at hand. And then um, at the end, the, the last section where I'll, I'll spend more of the time is really on some specific example applications where um, some of the misunderstandings or other misconceptions will be addressed. So the first, one of the first key points, um, if you remember when I had the, the picture a few charts back about the laser scanning confocal system, I told you that uh, the intensity is used to build up the height map. And that what I mean by that is the, the light intensity of that laser beam spot as it's scanned across the surface, the imaged intensity over on that confocal uh, uh, sensor after the pinhole is used to give you the height map. And because it's an intensity-based signal, it's actually broader when the numerical aperture of your imaging optics is, is small or your magnification is low. So what this chart is meant to show is that at low magnifications, you may measure the same surface 
that you're measuring at high magnifications to be very smooth or relatively smooth, around 4 nanometers roughness, as high as 100 times more uh, because the vertical resolution is just not as good when you're using that broad signal uh, for the low magnifications. So what is the practical implication for a laser scanning confocal system? They get very accurate, high accuracy data at high magnification. And that's just the, the nature of how those types of systems work. Um, if you need a large area, then you need, and you also require appreciable uh, vertical resolution, you know, half, half micron kind of numbers at the low magnifications is not uncommon to be seen. Uh, so if you require better than that, um, then you need to go ahead and do some stitching of the area of interest, which is fine because both uh, laser scanning tools and uh, coherent scanning tools are used to do image stitching all the time. But the point being, the, the real practical implication is when you have an application where you have uh, only need to measure a single field of view um, or very quickly uh, get data where you don't have too much concern about the vertical resolution uh, or the speed isn't critical if you want to do stitching, then the laser scanning system is, is totally fine and in fact does an excellent job for those kinds of applications. The key point is this broader intensity signal gets sharper at higher magnifications leads to these practical implications that I'm talking about for the laser scanning uh, confocal type system. So Analogously, the, the discussion we had around the white light interference system, uh, I told you at that time that the intensity uh, is not used, but instead you use the interference uh, of two beams, uh, to both from the sample and from a reference, and that coherent interference is what uh, is giving you the height information about your sample. And this is the, the real advantage for a white light interference based system is that confocal, uh, the confocality, if you will, is being set by coherence, which is not affected by the numerical aperture. It's just a function of the wavelength and the interference that occurs is giving you a definition of the vertical plane that has the same sharpness whether you're at low magnification or at very high magnification. And this is a a very key benefit and one of the next key point that I'd like you to keep in mind. And so what is the practical implementation or implication there for applications is that if high accuracy data or high vertical resolution data is required and especially over a, a large area if you have um, a low magnification requirement or would like to have that then white light interference techniques are a great technique when you have those criteria. If you require that good resolution or, or speed is critical and, and you need to measure a large area quickly, you can do that with low magnification and still get a very high vertical resolution from the system. And this is a, a, another very key point that I like to keep in mind when we talk about these two technologies. And then the third, I guess the third key point is to really uh, point out or explain in terms of the, how the two technologies actually make uh, a build up a height map. And, and on the left is just a simple schematic where you have the light source and I talked previously about a raster scanning using fast steering mirrors is typically how this is done for a laser scanning system. There are other systems that work differently, but for the purposes of the discussion today, we're talking about a laser scanning system. So if you want to build up a height, those, a height map over those three Z planes you see, which are meant to be the same in, in both, uh, both the left side and the right side, in the laser scanning system, the uh, raster scan, which is represented by those eight uh, bright spots in the lower plane, is accomplished, then a Z movement is made um, to go to the next plane and then another Z movement is made and in this case it would actually only be two Z movements between these these three planes but I think you get the idea. You, each plane is, is imaged uh, by doing a raster scan at each Z plane and then a Z movement is made 
to get the information. On the right hand side where I'm talking about a white light or a coherence scanning based system, there's basically a continuous Z movement while that same imaging sensor that we talked about is being used to capture the information necessary to compute the height as well. And so as at the camera frame rate as you're scanning Z, the XY data are captured in, in that field of view. Um, and it's, you know, that's really the kind of the key difference between the methods of acquisition, 3D image acquisition between these two uh, common, commonly used and, and well used technologies. So what is the practical implication here? Um, it's really an extension of what we talked about on the previous two charts. Um, if you're wanting to image one single field of view or a very low vertical height range, the laser scanning confocal system does that perfectly well um, and quickly. Uh, if you want to have an extended area image or if you have a long Z range to image, it's uh, at it's done more quickly with a coherent scanning type system. Uh, another practical implication is when vertical resolution is required and you need to do it quickly, um, it's easier to use a, a white light scanning system or a coherent scanning system because you can use a larger field of view, which is accomplished by a lower magnification, and still achieve that vertical resolution that you might need a, a 50x objective or, or even a 100x objective to achieve with the laser scanning uh, type system and stitching many images together when you have an extended uh, horizontal or extended uh, planar area that you want to image. Also if you have larger vertical sample ranges um, definitely there's a speed advantage that's gained by having a white light interference type system. So now that we've gone over kind of the brief introduction and all the different, um, the diff these two different techniques that we talked about, and I hope you have a, a little bit better understanding about how a laser scanning confocal system works, at least in general, versus how a white light interference microscope, at least in general, works. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about some specific uh, metrology applications or imaging applications where um, you can see some of these misunderstandings that I discussed uh, can be uh, given a little bit of an example showing how those are really not true about white light interference microscopes. So in the, the first one is really, um, this is just demonstrating kind of an, an, easy, uh, an easy example. There's, so these are pits that are in a surface that are um, if you look at the mean microns in the middle, they're, they're about 40 microns, 30 to 40 microns deep. Um, and you're imaging those over a pretty wide area. You know, not huge, but this is a, like a five, five X magnification area. And the, the application is looking at the defects on a ground shaft. And so if you think about doing this application and are an application like it, um, first of all, you have about 50 microns of, of Z or 60 microns of Z travel that you might need to scan. Uh, and if you wanted to do it over this larger area with any reasonable resolution, it helps to do it at low magnification. And so what this uh, chart is meant to demonstrate is that th so these data were obtained in, in one scan just in a, a few seconds um, at using a white light interference microscope. And then what you see down in the lower left is the automated detection of those regions uh, from that information to show the valleys. Uh, you can get the areas of those, the diameters of those all automatically with this type of a system, uh, especially the, the types of systems. This is using our uh, Vision 64 software from the, the 3D microscopes that we offer from here in the Stylus Optical Metrology Group in, in Bruker. But the key, key point is if you wanted to do this in a few seconds uh, with a laser scanning system, it would be very challenging because you have the you know, appreciable Z steps that you need in order to get the information and the, the wider field of view at a low magnification may not quite give you the resolution you need to, to uh, accurately quantify the, the types of uh, defects that you see. 
So if you think back on a few charts ago, I, I talked a little bit about some of the different misconceptions or things that people may have heard about uh, a white light scanning or a coherent scanning uh, system. Here's just an example application looking at roughness or pitch or thread depth on a screw. And somebody might say, well, this is hard to do or you can't do that on, on a, an interference-based system. That you just aren't able to do it. It's too hard to set up. Uh, you have to get the tilt perfectly right for the stages or you, you have to find those interference fringes and you can't measure those steep of angles. And in reality, so, uh, you know, I started here with this group in Bruker a few years ago, and I, I had to learn how to use these types of systems. And this is one of the first examples I, I set up myself. Um, really, in reality, it was quite simple um, to set up. You, you don't have to worry about things like the tilt fringes or, or finding them. You basically just place a part on the stage and you focus it like a microscope. Um, you use a, a, either a joystick focus or you can use a software controlled focus. You place the part, the part on there and find the focus and then go ahead and just click measure and that allows you to um, get a nice clean scan of this kind. You know, here's a 700 micron vertical scan with about a 55 degree angle. Uh, it's just kind of a scattering surface, somebody might say, but we'll, we can show some other examples of, of steeper surfaces as well. But the point being is you can you can measure those long scan ranges uh, in a single field of view uh, and it's done relatively quickly with um, not a lot of challenge at all setting up this type of a measurement. Uh, and you can get roughness along the, the teeth themselves as well as the depth from the root to the top. So someone might say, well, you can't measure smooth steep surfaces. Um, that's another kind of a, a common statement that I've heard made about these types of systems. And it is true that um, every interferometer-based or optical-based microscope has a fundamental limit about measuring smooth surfaces. Um, there are uh, systematic type things that uh, affect the quality of the data you get from smooth surfaces and ultimately you're limited by the numerical aperture of the collecting optics. So those are definitely true statements, but it's really not true to say that you, you are not able to measure a smooth slope or you can't resolve less than half a micron or these kinds of things. And so for an example of this, on, on the right I have some SEM pictures of different uh, pattern sapphire substrate surfaces that are used in the manufacture of HBLED. And so the applications there um, are really centered on looking at the structure geometry. They, people are interested in the pitch, the height, and the, the base diameter or the bottom diameter of these structures because it relates to how efficient the light uh, output will be from an LED downstream. And in reality, you can use uh, a 3D white light scanning interference microscope to measure these types of structures. And um, you can see some 3D images of those on the left. These are done very quickly um, because it's a high magnification and the scan length is extremely short. Uh, they're only generally a couple of microns tall and maybe a couple of two to three microns wide with a, a few microns pitch. The, the time to get the data is just a few seconds per site on, on one of these PSS wafers. Uh, you use an autofocus and just measure and it's, it's quite simple. So this example is one of the ones that I, I think is the most, I've heard this stated most often about uh, white light interference microscopes or, or coherent scanning microscopes. And this is, again, I'm speaking generally not just about what um, Bruker systems can do, but, but what other uh, white light systems can do as well. And I've heard stated in different conferences or at different discussions that a, a non-contact uh, interference-based measurement can't measure roughness. Uh, it doesn't correlate to a stylus or, or isn't able to measure roughness. And, you know, I have a lot of different examples of why that's not true, but I'm putting a, a particularly, you know, a tricky one here to show. Um, this is basically, you know, a, a commercially available uh, sample 
with about a hundred nanometer nominal roughness and you can see kind of the geometry there 10 micron pit period um, and uh, around a 300 nanometer peak to valley and this uh, you know we we can check this in many different ways uh, but people uh, have told me oh you can't you can't measure the roughness it, it won't work but in reality that's just simply not true um, the key things to remember for measuring roughness is is you have to keep in mind the standards that are used to set up filtering and the proper correlation lengths that you need, the evaluation and sampling lengths that you're interested in. Um, but once you do use those proper techniques, you can see um, on the right hand side, this is a, a stylus trace is the lower left on the right hand side of the page. This is using a two micron tip and a single 55 micron profile across that sample that I just showed you and the stylus comes up to 108 nanometer RA and if you look at the um, that 3D image that I had showed you is from a, a 3D microscope that we have sell from here in Bruker uh, on the right hand side you see a similar section we just took one cross section there and look at um, high magnification you can track everything down to the sidewalls the funny side structure as well as the ripple at the base of the trench and you come to basically the same number 105 nanometer uh, and this is a gauge capable um, non-contact technique for for measuring roughness and we have many people who are using the systems to do that as well as I'm sure many of our competitors do so this is a, a nice example uh, showing uh, how you can use a 3d optical microscope based on uh, white light interference to do roughness and you can do this across a range of samples, a range of textures, a range of roughness values. It's interesting to note, the nice thing about this is because it's non-contact and an area measurement, the orientation that you make the measurement of the sample is unimportant. The information is still uh, available once you've made that measurement. That's a, a key advantage as well. So uh, this next example application is um, you, one of the misperceptions or misconceptions, sorry, about uh, 3D interference microscope systems is they're not able to measure uh, different reflectance samples or samples that have low reflectance. Uh, and that comes from, I think, in the past people might have had that impression because systems used uh, poor quality illumination or didn't have as quite good quality optics. Um, generally it had to do with the illumination source itself. So people would think things like um, the, the bullet points here, you may not measure or uh, get a good image quality for dark or black materials. Uh, if you have different reflectances in the field of view, you won't be able to measure it. So how could you measure something like this USB insertion that I have on the right? And in reality, that um, it's very easy to do. You, uh, can scan one of those insertion uh, holes that are shown there. It's about a 450 micron depth, um, which has black plastic underneath and then that the metal around it. And it's very easy to do this. You you can set up a four built four by four millimeter area and and do those scans uh, and stitch them together in about 40 seconds. You have an image like the one I've shown you here. If you wanted to do step metrology checking for um, the accuracy of a step that you've made or machined uh, and you can have very high resolution data. Um, if you did this application, you could do this application with a laser scanning system as well, uh, a laser scanning confocal system. Uh, if you didn't care much about the Z resolution, you could do it at low magnification and um, but it still may take a little bit longer because the vertical range is is much higher, you know, each few microns in Z you move, you have to stop and do a raster scan. Uh, whereas here, uh, the example that I've given here, placing the part, uh, bring the, the part into optical focus and then just click the measure with the proper scan length and you're, and you're clean on the way to the data. Another uh, example I'd like to give is looking at color imaging. And a lot of people that are familiar with digital microscopes or, or laser scanning confocal microscopes 
have the impression or the understanding that a, a white light interference system can't give color images, and, and that's actually just not true. Um, it's, I think, just been a choice people uh, have made in the past, but certainly if, if you want to make a, an image with color, you, you can do it. Um, on the right-hand side, I have an example of a, a lead frame with some wire bond pads on it. Uh, and we'll just go ahead and have a look. Uh, here, you, you might think you're not able to tell materials apart or actually make a color image. But in reality, um, you actually are able, uh, one of those debonded wire bond pads, uh, you are able to make a color image using interferometric objectives even. Uh, you, if you're careful about how you process the signaling and uh, are looking at uh, different materials, for example, this is a, an aluminum bond pad with some pa passivation layers and it's uh, looking at the cavity imprint from a copper wire bond. We've pulled off the copper ball and it can see some differences in the center of the intermetallic compounds where the weld between the aluminum and the copper have formed and gives you different phases of the, the, the binding metals. Uh, you can also see the external area and the different passivation uh, showing the, the different colors of the metals there as well. And this is an image that's made with one of our uh, 3D microscopes and a color camera. Uh, another example, um, there are some misconceptions about the ability of a system like this to uh, measure accurately when there is a diffuse surface as well as a low reflectant surface, uh, as I mentioned previously. Uh, you might have heard, or I know at least I have heard um, people talk about this as a quasi-confocal system. I, I explained that you can think of a white light interference system as a, as a type of confocal system. It doesn't have a pinhole, this is true, but it does use coherence to help you set the vertical planes of, of comparison. Uh, some people might think that it suffers uh, poor signal because of light pollution or it's difficult to measure diffuse or rough surfaces because of this. But in reality, if you're careful about how you process the camera frames information, this is, this is not the case. So for an example here, I'm just showing um, this is a printed ink sensor. Uh, it's a, a larger area sensor. You can see the entire sensor on the lower uh, right is about a five millimeter square, very roughly. Um, there are about 30 micron deep uh, trenches that are cut into that print, printed ink uh, with a laser. And basically looking at um, these types of sensors in production, if you, if you want to make a measurement of that, the, the, rough, the surface of the printed ink is relatively rough, uh, not a lot of reflectance. Um, but even at low magnification with um, a little bit of bright, high brightness LED illumination, you're able to make very good measurements of this type of a, of a part and can demonstrate uh, gauge repeatability and reproducibility very capable um, for standard production tolerances that are set on this type of a system. And that, uh, that is all done, this type of a measurement, in around 30 seconds for, for that measurement area, just less than 30. <clears throat> just uh, give, I think this is one final example about uh, some different applications. Um, where doing uh, a 3D white light interference microscope scan uh, can be very useful. You, in microfluidics, there are many trenches or, or different um, trends, trenches with different widths and depths that are on the order of tens to a few to 25 or even 50 or 100 microns at times. Um, in this example, this is etched silicon, and we're looking at some trenches that are, you know, if, few microns deep. Um, I think the Z here is about 15 microns on the right hand side. You can see it. But you can also see the defect in the middle. Uh, you can see that very clearly. And you're getting relatively uh, easily and very quickly very high quality data for this. This is a single field of view at about 50x magnification. Um, 
another this is an application where a laser scanning system could also do the job but you wouldn't uh, necessarily come to uh, three nanometer vertical resolution and may not be able to do it so quickly so there is a, a, a capability that is offered by this type of a technology that uh, is very useful for a variety of applications So uh, now that I've gone through, we covered the outline, uh, I'd just like to come to a summary. And then at the, uh, after the summary, I'll go ahead and, and spend some time answering questions uh, that have been asked throughout the discussion. So to start with, I gave a brief introduction and overview and then describe some general 3D optical microscope techniques uh, with then focus on laser scanning confocal microscopes and white light interference microscopes used to do 3D optical measurements. I presented a few common misconceptions that uh, at least I've heard and many others have, have explained to me they've heard about white light interference microscope systems and then I try to give some key points for uh, understanding how to choose between or understanding the value that comes from choosing between these two different types of technologies. Where there is uh, capability for both, uh, they both are great instruments to use. Um, when there are speed con considerations or large area considerations, uh, we really feel that the white light interference system is a better choice to enable uh, accurate measurements over a wide area. Also when having wide area measurements with high vertical resolution are required, it is a, a great benefit to go with a white light interference type system. And then for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, we've gone over some different examples applications um, with both images and also some step or roughness metrology examples and showed those from a few different industrial or, or research areas how a 3D white light microscope can really actually meet those needs uh, when in fact um, some of the mis misconceptions might have led one to believe that that was not the case. So with that I think uh, it's about time that we could open up for some questions. I really want to thank you for taking time today. Uh, if you don't uh, if, just as a reminder, if you don't remain on during the question and answer, uh, we really do as, as a way of making these uh, webinar discussions more valuable for uh, people who choose to attend them. Uh, I really would appreciate it if you take the time to spend uh, 30 seconds answering the survey that you get upon exiting the webinar. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the questions so that we can uh, see go ahead and answer those. Okay, so the first question, um, someone asks, uh, what, how does the lateral resolution compare between the systems? So the lateral resolution um, in any microscope system is fundamentally, you know, you can call it out a few different ways. Some people will call it out uh, by the Sparrow criteria, um, some people We'll call it out a little differently depending on what their, their needs are. Uh, typically, um, I've seen some confocal microscope manufacturers talk about uh, 100 nanometer or 200 nanometer resolution. I've never actually seen lateral resolution. I've never seen uh, really good data that demonstrates that. Um, I've also seen uh, people have the belief that a, a white light system uh, might have lower lateral resolution because the numerical apertures are lower and that is actually that's strictly true uh, if you only use um, uh, numerical aperture and wavelength to tell you about the lateral resolution you may lose a little bit of lateral resolution but we've done um, here at least within Bruker we've done some work to improve on the lateral resolution that you can obtain using these special interference microscope objectives that allows us to demonstrate uh, lateral resolution down to as small as 150 nanometers. And now this is not a strict uh, imaging, it's, uh, it's imaging and also processing, but 
Uh, this is an important distinction. We can uh, make good images laterally uh, showing that kind of resolution even with this type of a, a interference-based microscope. So someone asks, um, Someone asks, do you have examples showing structure of a liquid, a high viscosity surface? I'd like to show how fast liquid flows on a structured surface and would structured substrate and would need a 3D map. Ah, so this is a, an excellent question and a very interesting one. Uh, the, to actually make images at this type of a, of a speed, if there's a fast flowing uh, surface, the kind of technique that you would need to use would need to be insensitive to that motion. And the kinds of uh, imaging that we offer currently um, would not actually address such a need. There are other methods that you might consider to do it, but with, with the systems that we offer today, that would be a challenging application to show. Someone asks, uh, can you expand a little bit on blue light interferometry? What are the advantages versus white light Okay, so um, blue light interferometry or using uh, some people would call it PSI or phase shifting or um, just a coherent or more coherent uh, interference measurement. The, the differences or the advantages have to do with measuring a smooth surface versus a rough surface, um, giving you more coherence in the, the fringes that you have versus less and being able to address a smooth surface uh, metrology need uh, with a, a single wavelength or a, a, a shorter coherence length uh, versus a longer coherence length. If you have longer coherence length, you're able to, on smooth surfaces, do a nice clean phase shifting measurement, much as you would in a Fizeau-based interferometer or another type of measurement technique. Uh, for white light, um, when we say white light, we really are using the combined light, uh, in our systems at least, of a, a white uh, LED and could also use some of the components of the green. Um, but that broader band source gives you a, sh a narrower coherence, which um, gives that 3 nanometer vertical resolution for getting the, the coherence uh, resolution for getting the vertical information that you need about the surface. The, di the distinct advantage for the single wavelength or the more coherent wavelength is that your vertical resolution in that case goes down to you know 0.1 nanometers or so. So if you have a very smooth surface and you want to characterize the roughness very well uh, using a single you know blue light or green light type um, measurement gives you very high vertical resolution in that case. So someone has asked, um, the world or sample isn't always flat. This is very true. Um, how well can WLI reproduce form while also resolving finer scale roughness? Um, so that kind of a, sti say, stitching along a sphere or a curved surface. So already today we've demonstrated um, in the ophthalmic industry for a 5 millimeter to 7 millimeter sample uh, diameter. We've demonstrated absolute form to less than 0.2 microns while also giving the smooth, uh, sur these are diamond turn parts that are very smooth, so kind of 30 nanometer local roughness. So um, that, the, that's one specific example and uh, as things progress technologically, I think you, you will see that we will extend that capability much further into the world of form and finish uh, to go and address other applications. But I hope that addresses that question. Um, I have another question here uh, that says, uh, how quickly can you measure an entire field of view uh, with using white light interferometry versus a laser scanning interferometer? So an entire field of view by that, uh, in that question, I take that to mean just one single field of view at one single height um, 
I would, if those are the comparison uh, criteria, then the two are about equivalent. Um, if you're just looking at one single field of view, one, one image with a laser scanning system is a little bit less than a second, um, you know, maybe around a second. An intensity measurement with uh, a white light system is also around a second. Um, those kinds of, of comparisons are challenging, though, because I expect the question has to do with a larger area and maybe a larger scan length. And in that case, the larger the area for a given vertical resolution required, the faster you will do with a uh, white light interference system. But for a single field of view, for a single vertical plane, uh, the two get the image about the same speed. Um, somebody asks about what is the radius accuracy of a form measurement? Um, they ask about a specific material like an IOL. Um, but in general, for a form measurement, if you're looking at uh, radius of curvature, provided you properly calibrate a white light interference system, basically making sure your magnification is calibrated properly for the, the like for example, micro lenses, or if you're looking at ball bearings or other spherical parts, or maybe not spherical, but if there's a base radius that you care about, provided you calibrate the magnification properly, uh, the accuracy is quite high. Um, you, you can get um, the height measurement accuracy is, as we talked about, for a single field of view uh, in the few nanometers range, but even if you're getting a form on the order of 0.1 or you know, 0.2, uh, 0.2 microns, uh, you can compute what your radius accuracy would be based on the, the sag error that would give you for a given, a given lens. Uh, and I am now being signaled that we are uh, uh, out of time for the discussion. So those are the uh, last questions. And if there are other questions that you have, uh, you can see my email address at the top of the screen there, uh, matt.novak at bruker-nano.com. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to have the chance to speak about this topic today, and I appreciate you spending the time. Uh, again, feel free to send questions if I didn't get a chance to answer yours. I apologize for that, uh, but I will follow up after the, the webinar. And um, as you leave or exit the presentation, please take time to answer the brief uh, five, few questions uh, survey so that we can provide better discussions and, and improve the quality of the webinars as we move forward in the future. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day.